half in the bag. What are stories but mystery boxes? There's a fundamental question in TV. The first act is called the teaser. It's literally the teaser. It's the big question. So you're drawn into it. And then, of course, there's a lot of questions. You know, droids, Star Wars, you know, droids, you mystery boxes. It sure is good to be back at the VCR repair shop. Even if the heater is broken, I see you have got a sweater on. I have 15 layers on. I don't have any layers on because I'm covered in fat. Oh, the phone's ringing. Oh. Lightning Fest VCR Repair Shop, this is Mike. How can I help you? Oh, hi, Mr. Plinkett. How are you? Uh-huh. Oh, sounds intriguing. What does he want? Hold on. It's Mr. Plinkett. He wants us to go on another wacky adventure. I mean, he wants us to talk about the new Cloverfield film. Three. 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 Morning, beautiful. Two. 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 I'm getting sick of only seeing you on a screen. One. 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 Please, God. <laughs> Shazam! Razzmatazz! Super Bowl! I mean, the big game! Marketing scams! It's time to talk about the new film, The Cloverfield Paradox. Ever wonder how a large Godzilla monster came to Earth in a previous film? No, neither did I! Hi, I'm Red Letter Media, and today we're talking about a group of characters from Earth on a space station trying to turn on a machine to create a power source for an Earth that's running out of energy and on the brink of war. Sound interesting? Well, it's not! Well, Jay, while watching the Super Bowl, I mean the big game, uh, there was an advertisement, surprisingly, for a third Cloverfield film. Yes, I think we should discuss that before discussing the film, because uh, I think, uh, at least for me, my feelings on the movie play into this lead up to it. Um, but yeah, just out of nowhere, they kind of did that with the 10 Cloverfield Lane too, where it was like two months before the movie came out, like, hey, there's a new Cloverfield, and nobody knew. Mm. Uh, it turned out that it was sort of a retrofitted movie. It wasn't intended to be Cloverfield, and they're like, hey, this is a movie that nobody's heard of, nobody will see, we'll put the Cloverfield name on it, and uh, it'll get a little more interest in it, which worked at that movie's advantage, because it was a really good movie. Um, and then this movie comes out of nowhere, uh, the day it's released, direct to Netflix. Nobody knew it was coming. Just, hey, there's a new Cloverfield movie. You can watch it after the game. But yeah, I thought that was super exciting. I was like, this is neat because... <laughs> yeah, just well, redefine this, super exciting. No, well, this ties into... Well, I, I like the idea of the Cloverfield series as being these kind of uh, unconnected... An unconnected anthology series. Yeah, I, I, I am like... On the opposite side of the planet, Jay. Okay. I just don't give two flying shits. It's like the Twilight Zone, but theatrical. It's what uh, uh, John Carpenter wanted to do with the Halloween series, with the third one, and then nobody liked that. So yeah, anthology. Digging up Michael Myers again. Anthology series never ever work unless they're episodic television. In in movie form. Well, how often does that happen in movies? That's kind of what I think is interesting: is that it's a unique idea. It's it's a scam. It's not well, a unique idea, it's a scam. They well, made a monster in, movie. In this particular case, it's turned out to be a scam. Um, they're, ri they're running off the steam still, off the gas from the first Cloverfield movie, and Cloverfield now is a tarnished brand to me. But we'll, we'll yes, get... Yes, I would agree, but... Uh, and, and I use the word brand loosely. But uh, I have my own theories about how this came to be. Maybe you did some research. I did absolutely no research. Yes. I can put forth my theory if you want. And you want me to tell you if you're correct or not? Yeah. Okay. Because um, this movie was produced by J.J. Abrams, mm -hmm. his, his company Bad Robot. So it, it was, unless they retroactively said we produced it after they picked up some movie. But uh, so maybe they did set forth to make a third film in the Cloverfield anthology. They made it. They test screened it. Everyone said it was terrible. And they said, what do we do? How about this scam where we release it on the same day as the Super Bowl? I mean, the big game. <laughs> and uh, we'll save a whole bunch of money on marketing costs because we won't do any marketing. People will think, hey, I'll watch this. Yeah. We'll sell it to Netflix for $1 <laughs> over what we cost to make it so we can write it off as a profit yeah. and move on with our lives. 
Am I anywhere close to being correct? Uh, not exactly. It wasn't shot as a Cloverfield movie, much like 10 Cloverfield Lane. It was its own thing. And then it was, uh, what I think happened is they realized that they had a big turd on their hands. So they said, let's shoot a couple more scenes, which they did, to connect it to the Cloverfield universe. Universe. Well, the, the big monster at the end didn't feel tacked on, so I, 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 Th that I felt this, completely. Yeah. I find this hard to believe. Well, I don't think they even say the like it's because the ship is called the Cloverfield, but I think that's just in like you hear voices say it, like off-camera voices. Um, so there's a couple pickup shots here and then here and there. The ending is reshot, so I think what they they said was, okay, we have this movie, it's subpar, we'll make it a Cloverfield movie. And we'll dump it on Netflix. We'll have an ad on the Super Bowl to make it feel like it's this interesting new marketing technique as an event, mm. um, which I, I fell for because we've talked recently about uh, our hope for the death of theaters. And this played into that, where it's like, hey, there's a new movie in this franchise. Here it is. But yeah, it turns out to be a scam. This doesn't help. No, that, that no, cause. this has killed any interest in, yeah. one, the Cloverfield series, but also. Uh, it almost feels like the phrase dumped on Netflix is becoming a thing. Yes. It's like in the 90s when there was direct-to-video was had like a negative stigma, even though I loved a lot of direct-to-video stuff, but they were all like lower budget crap movies, you know, they're not your, uh, your Ninja Turtle franchise or your Star Wars, it's just cheap direct-to-video, it's the Puppet Master series. <laughs> So I think uh, uh, direct-to-Netflix has potential to become the new direct-to-video. Everything's on, on kind of, it's, it's like a toddler learning how to walk, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, you, have, sure. you have Amazon Studios producing films. Good movies. Good movies that are in theaters on Amazon. Manchester Am by the Sea was yeah. Amazon. Amazon right? has a lot of quality films. And Netflix even, I mean, like, you have, you have the Bright situation, which was like this big thing because of how how big the budget was. And then yeah. it comes out and it's like, it gets terrible reviews, but then it's like the highest grossing Netflix viewed thing ever. And, ever, and it's like, what, Wait, what's happening? But, but Netflix is, they're on thin ice. With it's, me, with their content, with their tricky. original content. Yeah, well, it's it's like Gerald's Game is one of my favorite movies of last year, and that was direct to Netflix. And then uh, 1922, which is another Stephen King adaptation, that's a fantastic movie made for Netflix. Well, um, let me correct that as a, uh, their feature film department. Okay, not, well, that's not the made for Netflix. Well, they're series. 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 Yeah, yeah, there's some good different. series, yeah. but then there's also like. I don't know what the Fuller House or they well, produce sure. the Adam Sandler movies. Yeah. They seem to be catering to like, is there an audience for yeah. this? Boom, we'll plug in and we'll make it. Yeah. Um, so they've made some excellent feature films. Uh, I have not seen The Open House. Did you see that one? Okay, yeah. The, I, I wanted to bring up two horror <laughs> movies. That The Open House was was god awful. Um, it was it was dull and dry, and then it had the stupidest ending I've ever seen in my life, okay. where it was a non-ending. Mm. It, was, it was a who done it, but at the end they don't tell you who done it. <laughs> and then it just ends, and it was awful. And then I watched another film called Before I Wake, and it was like, it had this spooky little kid on the cover, and Jacob Tremblay. Jacob Tremblay, he, he somehow de-aged three years. Yeah, yeah, the star of the room. <laughs> um, his acting is 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 bad in this. Oh, uh, and he, see, and that's the same director as Gerald's Game, which is a fantastic movie, and I like some of his other movies. So I don't know what happened with this one, but um, I know it sat on a shelf for a couple years, and then they're like, "Yeah, I'll just sell it to Netflix." Yeah, yeah, like you said, dumping ground, and, yeah. and it's it's like Jacob Tremblay, star of the Room. I mean, the Room was a great film, and Room, <laughs> star of Room. I was going to avoid correcting you because I wanted to keep having the Room poster pop. Yeah, up. yeah. I'm still going to do I it. Caught myself. Um, you know, he, he does good in that movie, hmm? but then th there's this like, yeah, this piece of shit movie that was on a shelf <laughs> and then they, they trick you. It's everything's, you're, you just, just trick them. Like you said <laughs> recently. Just trick them. It's all. really disappointing in the case of this movie too, because I, I legitimately was excited by this sort of release strategy. Because mm. I like the idea of like, we're not going to worry about reviews. We're not going to worry about right. Rotten Tomatoes. We're not going to worry about advanced buzz and releasing trailers a year before the fucking movie comes out and just like constantly releasing new information about it, uh, new behind the scenes stills and having uh, people that make terrible internet shows discussing all the minutia of it. It's like, oh, this movie just exists now. Like that's exciting to me. 
I, I swear, um, uh, someday the big theaters are just going to be Disney Marvel. It'll movies. just be every theater will be owned by Disney. Every movie in it will be a Disney product, and that's where you go to see the big spectacle movies. And if you want to watch real movies, you go to Amazon or Netflix. And you watch them in the comfort of your home where you don't have to deal with annoying assholes. It might, it might go that direction, but they've really got to be mindful of the quality because you, you, you fool me once, <laughs> shame on me. I'm sorry, I'm doing a George Bush. <laughs> fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. We got this turd, we'll dump it direct to Netflix and apparently there's a fourth Cloverfield movie that's coming out later this year that's gonna be theatrical. Which makes this one even more suspect, where it's like, we got this movie, we've been working on it for a while, it sucks, uh, we'll make it a Cloverfield movie, we'll dump it direct Netflix, and we'll just move on. Let's get out of town, quick. They're, they're running out with their bags, their suitcases full of money. It's like a carnival. <laughs> it's just literally like a carnival. Um, Well, let's talk about the movie. We've set it up enough where, we're, we're, like, ne talking about Netflix is a complex discussion and, and streaming movies and, and... Well, this movie is an important stepping stone in what direction Netflix is going to go, whether it's up yes. or down, I'm not sure anymore. Yes. Yeah. Um, between Bright and this, because Bright is, like, that was their, like, oh, we're going to release a big blockbuster type movie with a real movie star, and that's, they've mostly released smaller things until now. Mm -hmm. So Bright was, like, a big turd. And then this movie, which is not only a bigger budget movie, but also part of an established franchise, a successful franchise. So it's like, oh, okay, this is interesting. They're going a different direction with this, doing the viral marketing thing that they kind of did with the other movies, but taking it up a notch. And then this is just like worse than Bright. Cue slide whistle. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't seen Bright, but, but, but what I mean by you, you're saying it's a turd, but it was successful for Netflix, which is yes. which is odd because well, this will like probably said, be successful too. Yeah, yeah. There's little chunks mm -hmm. of people that that remain and and I can see people watching this movie and kind of liking it because um, whoever wrote this, they, they had a they, they did pen, it by hand. Oh, they, okay. they did it in calligraphy. <laughs> whoever wrote this said, "Here's a space movie, and it's going to be a thrill a minute." set pieces, weird shit happens, it'll keep you on the edge of your seat. Now, are you approaching it, what they were doing originally before it became Cloverfield? Yeah, thing? yeah. Okay. And then, um, I mean, Cloverfield just like, you need a monster at the end, <laughs> or something, <laughs> that, that big monster. It's a big fat producer with a giant yeah, cigar. Yeah. Well, you need a monster at the end, and then we can call it Cloverfield. We put a monster <laughs> at the end. Um, so, so the, uh, the, the, then whoever wrote it, in calligraphy, <laughs> said, uh, we just need a bunch of weird, crazy shit to happen. Uh, and then someone says, well, what, what, does it make any sense? No! Uh, parallel universe. Thing. It doesn't matter if it makes sense. It's in a parallel universe. Why does this guy's arm get cut off and then have a mind of its own and, and is trying to tell them things? That's the one weird thing that happens in the identical parallel universe, Jay. <laughs> that if you have a, a, an amputated limb, it moves on its own. I think my arm's trying to write something. That's the only thing. <laughs> Everything else is the same. It's just, <laughs> just that just, one thing. Uh, so premise is uh, the Earth is on the brink of war. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the spoilers, the very end of the film, we reveal that, that whatever the scientists did created the, the monster from Cloverfield, right? Possibly. Okay. Because I remember the opening of Cloverfield was like hipsters at a party mm -hmm. in New York or something, and there was no mention of world war breaking out. It was just no. monster appears. No. Oh, shit. So, okay, so there, that doesn't make sense. Well, there, there's, I can explain a little bit of the little tiny bit of research I've done as far as how these films connect, but let's get through this movie first. Okay, um, okay world's, world's running out of energy. It, it opens with our two, our main character and her husband. Uh, they're, they're waiting for gas, so uh, the, you know, there's an energy crisis. And so the, the idea is that a bunch of smart scientists and crew members will go up to this, this newly built space station um, called the Cloverfield Station. Uh, but really, it's called Shepard the Shepherd because that's what the name of the machine is. Hmm. 
and uh, that's all. That's why I was getting confused. That's why the voiceover just says, it's called the Cloverfield, we swear. But the, the, the atom smashing machine that creates energy is called the, the Shepherd. Uh, so they go up there and, and basically it's like, um, what do they call it, a, a Hadron Collider? Or the, it's a, the, there's, 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 there's a giant one in Illinois at a place called Fermi Lab. I think it's like like miles long. It's a big circle and they shoot like particles around it like almost the speed of light. They hit each other and I think they do something when that happens. They create energy or It opens a parallel universe that makes arms move on their own. I think I think when they they collide they make like like a piece of antimatter for like 1 trillionth of a second. They're saying like when they smash the atoms together at such a speed it's possible to create a tiny black hole. Yeah. Which was the premise for Space Cop, if you recall. <laughs> Um, I don't recall the plot for Space Cop. Of course, the, ex the, the uh, experiment goes wrong, and then they appear uh, on the other side of the sun for no reason. That they can't find? Are they like, the Earth, Earth's gone, and they don't think to look around anything else around them? Well, they're really far away. I guess. And I guess they can't read constellations. <laughs> Being smart scientists, they're quality scientists. Yeah. Well, they had they have uh, their MacGuffin is is a gyroscope magic thing. Oh yeah. That helps the ship think and do computer stuff. So, uh, eh, they're they're physicists, they're technicians. Maybe they're not space explorers. I don't know. That's fine. Whatever. So they end up in a parallel universe, and then this is where. This is where things go nuts. I, yeah. This is where the movie goes off the rails. Uh, we get to know our main character as the movie goes along, and she has a little bit of a, a moral dilemma, which is kind of interesting. Um, that actress's name, by the way, she has the most amazing name I've ever heard. The actress's name is Gugu Mbatha-Ra. <laughs> Gugu? Her name is Gugu. I love it. It's great. Mbatha-Ra. That sounds like a Star Wars <laughs> it character. It sounds like a Star Wars character. Google? Well, it's hyphenated. It's B Mabatha dash Raw. Uh, I she did great as an actress. Um, yeah, no, everybody's fine. And, They're and, all good actors. They're just not given much to do. And and the guy from Selma, uh, I don't know how to say his name. David Otulio. Something like that. It's hard for me to pronounce. I'm culturally insensitive. <laughs> um, but he he's he's good. Hmm? I mean, uh, what's his face? Uh, O'Dowd. Chris O'Dowd. Chris O'Dowd yeah. is in it. Eh, he's, he's a comic, a comic relief. relief. Um, so so you, you set up these characters, but um, uh, Gugu's character, <laughs> um, the, the, we we get we get a Sandra Bullock s gravity arc yeah. with her, where it's like there's some kind of family thing going on. You don't really know until the end. And I really would have liked the film more if it if it just focused on her yeah. and and that tragedy well, that's, with, with the fire. And then, yeah, that's the interesting aspect is that moral dilemma of in her dimension, her family's dead. Uh, there was like an accident, there was a fire, her kids and her, did her husband, no, her husband didn't die because he's still alive, um, but her kids died. And now in this other dimension, her kids are alive. And so she has this dilemma of like, you know, what do I do? Yeah. Which could be interesting, but it's not fleshed out enough. And there's like, it's, it's a much more complicated dilemma than the movie gets into, which is like, this would rip apart time and space if you from this other dimension comes down to earth. Like, yeah. it well, seems like it would be very dangerous. And that sort of sci-fi dilemma is old hat from where? Oh, why? You're, you're drinking from a very, a very interesting mug with Star Trek characters on it. Yeah, you have this big moral dilemma. You have got this main character who's sort of like, she's broken, she's sad, or, or what happened to her? She accidentally burned up her kids by, <laughs> by using a- It's like Manchester by the Sea, but in space. Yeah, uh, um, spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> um, she used a, like an illegal power cell to give them power and it burned their house down. And she, so she's, and then she gets, into this parallel universe where she discovers her kids are alive and do, does she want to go back and and david o says like you can't go back like there'll be two of you like that this is her world not yours and then yeah. she has this big emotional scene at the end where she's like crying and recording this message and i'm like i feel nothing yeah uh, i should feel something but i feel nothing because this none of this was set up they yeah it kind of it's it's comes way late in the movie yeah and everything before that is just like a bunch of goofy shit they need to open the movie with the house fire uh, and just like really hit you with the emotion like putting i, the kids I actually to bed thought and when they were introducing that in the movie i was like did i miss a scene earlier did they set this up i was i was confused yeah. for a moment because i thought i missed something yeah it, fe <laughs> it felt like scenes were missing yeah um, but yeah, like uh, watching this movie, like there was a couple, there was a couple of exciting scenes, but they were really just like 
like visceral action scenes that are that, like, that's, okay. I, I like that stuff on its own. Some of the weirder. There's like yeah. some odd like body horror stuff that I liked. Like the, the, the guy's uh, eye sideways. Yeah, that, I was thinking of, because this movie reminded me of a billion different movies, but during that I was kind of thinking of Prometheus. And then like, yeah, the arm stuff is like kind of treat that more humorous. But, and it doesn't make any sense, but it's interesting visually. Yeah. It was kind of fun. They put the arm in like a box and it's like writing out messages right. to him. The other crew member appearing in the middle of like the wall. Yeah, the person from the dimension that they end up in yeah. is like stuck in the wall it's really bizarre they have to pull the panel off and there's like wires stuck through her yeah. and it's like this is kind of creepy but you mentioned the moral dilemma with her going back and like her kids are alive in this dimension this, this whole premise reminded me of an episode of, St of Star Trek Voyager. Okay. Uh, 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 and I won't be annoying about this. One of my favorite episodes from season two, <laughs> it's called Deadlock. Bloodlock? Um, Deadlock. Oh. The Star Trek Voyager goes into, it's hiding in a space cloud and electricity and some sort of weird, weird spatial anomaly. Uh, duplicates the ship. They share the same engine, but two levels of reality exist on top of one another. Oh, okay. So it opens in the beginning, the, one of the crew members, I forget her name, she's having a baby. There's a baby born on Voyager that grows up into a little girl. Little bumps on her head. <laughs> forget the name. It's like <laughs> something with a K, I can't remember. The baby, is it Gugu? It it's Gugu. It's Gugu. <laughs> the baby's born, right? The baby's born and then, and then it dies. And so they're like, sorry, your baby died. And then at some point, Harry Kim gets blown out into space. Oh my God. And they're like, Harry Kim's dead. <laughs> He's blown out into space. And then after a while, they realize you, the Voyager that you're following, their ship keeps like damaging excel, itself and blowing up. And they're like, why is everything not working right? And then they figure out that there's another Voyager on top of them existing in the exact same space. That's all right. Hmm. And so at the very end, they're like, listen, we got to blow up one of these Voyagers in order for anyone to live. And so they blow up the one that we started with, hmm. which is weird. But they're like, before we blow it up, we found a little rift in the space. We're gonna send Harry Kim and the baby over since they died in your universe. And then they blow up the other Voyager. <laughs> so the Harry Kim from season two on is-, is It's like an alternate universe. It's an alternate okay. universe Harry Kim. And I've, I've always loved that episode. And it's cause it's so like, um, you, they figure out a way to talk to each other on the view screen. So it's like this Janeway's talking to that Janeway. Yeah. And like, Hi, you know, you're, you, we, we, one of us has to blow up. Like, and it's, it, the whole episode, there's no, like, obviously there's no big, like, exciting set pieces and action because it's just a little TV show. Right. The whole thing's set on, like, the, the, working the problem out and the moral dilemma and almost immediately you kind of understand what the problem is. Yeah. And so it's working to solve the problem mixed with the moral dilemma and solution. Well, and that's what you were just describing is like 10 Cloverfield Lane until the tacked on J.J. Abrams' big monster ending. But like 90% of that movie is them in the bunker and it was characters yes. and it was moral and dilemma that's, stuff. That's a whole different thing. And that's, it's, it's, that's what was disappointing about this movie was after 10 Cloverfield Lane, where it's like, oh, this is what this series is going to be. Like, great. Like almost like theatrical Black Mirror episodes or something. The, the idea also of the earth on the brink of war and scientists in space trying to uh, start up this power generating machine and, and the trials and tribulations of that. Yeah. That's interesting to me. And because they're like, oh, yeah, Russia's they, going to invade, you know, and I'm like, hey, this is weird. When they were and, talking about the earth, I was yeah. hoping we would go down there yeah. more. But instead we go down there to see Gugu's husband mm -hmm. who finds a little kid. And then that goes nowhere, that entire storyline. Like what happened to that little kid? Her parents texted thanks. <laughs> Don't you remember? <laughs> Who the fuck cares? Yeah, exactly. That well, felt like it, like that was added in to make it more Cloverfield. So we keep cutting back to Earth, and there's like, yeah, he he, he gets out of his car at one point, and you see like a city in ruins, and you see a shadow of the monster, and you're like, oh, okay, it's the Cloverfield monster. Well, also they had that little bit where they're they're the crackpot on the news, like whose last name was the same as John Goodman's last name oh. in Clover Ten Cloverfield Lane, but it's obviously not the same character. But he's like, yeah, if we open up a, a, a dimensional rift, monsters can come through. Like a Cloverfield monster. Mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, is that gonna happen? Yeah. Maybe that will happen. Well, that's, that's from what I understand, that's supposed to be the explanation for the way any of these movies connect is when they're in space and they open up that rift, it basically created all these different alternate 
dimensions. So like the first Cloverfield movie is one, the second 10 Cloverfield Lane is a different, and then this is the third. Even though the third one takes place 30 years after the first two happened. But when you open a rift, it can be a rift through time and space. So the monsters can fall through, but they can fall through into a different time. This sounds like Lost. It's, well, that's exactly what I was thinking. It was like, oh, we're, we're setting up all these things that is just a bunch of nonsense and it'll be a waste of time. Just like six seasons of Lost. <laughs> Which is why 10 Cloverfield Lane, like, you don't need any of this information, and the movie works just fine as its own, as, like, a doomsday movie. There, there, there's, this movie doesn't know what it wants to be. There's, mm -hmm. there's 10, we could list anything from Event Horizon, Solaris, uh, I, I was going to ask you, I haven't seen Event Horizon in a very long time, but when I was watching this, I was getting flashbacks to it. Yeah. Isn't it the same thing? They travel through a wormhole or something? The Event and they Horizon. End up in a Hellraiser world? Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think it had a, some kind of star drive that like folded time and space, like a warp drive almost, but and then it opened up a rift to hell, I think. Mm -hmm. Something, something like, like okay. I, I haven't seen it in a long time, but uh, similar concept, you know, space horror. Which yeah, I don't it's think. It's an alien, some Prometheus. I don't think space horror has worked since 1979, <laughs> has it? We we never get that like that alien scene where they're all eating dinner together and you know like we get. That's to know why the Alien characters. works so well as a space horror movie because they just feel like I mean they're space truckers they just feel like people hanging out doing their yeah. job. And scientists can feel like people hanging out doing their job, but you need to have them have personalities and characters. Sure. This is, I think this really was just it, it was a circus that came to town and said look at the attractions. <laughs> Attraction one is the lady appears in a wall screaming. Attraction two is a guy's eye moves and Oh, and then worms he vomits up worms. Yeah, yeah, worms fly out. And then the attraction three, a Chinese lady caught in a, fro in a water tank. Attraction four, the spinning spaceship. <laughs> Come see the spinning spaceship. <laughs> Aren't all these scenes exciting? Well, they and don't then you wow them at the ending with a, a shocker climax. Yeah, that, that we didn't expect. That we didn't expect? That, even though they told us six times it was, <laughs> it was coming. I do, I do gotta say, that last shot kind of gave me the chills, even though it didn't make any sense. Did just eat their little spaceship? No, you just see the spaceship go down into the clouds. Yeah. And it must have been like, I don't know, like the, the, the dimension of it, like creeped me out, like goes down in the clouds and it's super tiny. And then like yeah. a giant version of the Cloverfield monster pops up and it's just like, ooh, that thing's so huge. It's scary. Oh, yeah. Well, but it just, doesn't make any sense and who cares? It should have just came up in the space. <laughs> <laughs> the earth, it's gone. It's big, blue, full of angry people. Keep looking, you'll find it. So uh, th uh, it's, it's, it's a circus that came to town and took your money and left town. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Like, yeah. Netflix, you got to step up your game. Like, well, Martin Scorsese's next movie is being made for Netflix. Like, the greatest living filmmaker. So we got that to look forward to. Mm. Of course, he's dredging up the corpses of like Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci. So, what is he making? I don't. Uh, the Irishman, it's called. I don't know anything like about a, it. A mobster thing. I don't know. Grumpy old mobsters. That's what it'll be called. <laughs> El Pacino's in it too. I, I think. I'd watch that. Yeah, I, grumpy I, old mobsters. I'd watch that. <laughs> I would say up until the last couple months, I was really uh, optimistic about Netflix and where they were going with the movies that they were making, and then like Bright and this, it's like ugh. It, 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 it's it's like it's like like cutting your heroin with like 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 sawdust. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you you want good stuff. You want the high quality heroin. Yeah. And you're like you get tricked. I'm surprised that Winchester movie wasn't direct to Netflix. That somehow got a theatrical release. Well, that's a thing too. Is that should have been direct to Netflix. They could have sold that Winchester movie to Netflix, and it wouldn't have gotten. 13% Rotten Tomato score, like that's the harbinger of doom. The good thing about streaming is you could turn something on, watch it for 10 minutes and shut it off if you don't like it, as opposed to going and paying in, in a theater. Well, one, one, yeah, one positive of this uh, Cloverfield uh, paradox, what's it called? Cloverfield paradox. Um, I was watching it late at night and I got so fucking bored I fell asleep, but then I could just wake up the next morning and finish it. If I had fallen asleep in the theater, I would have had to buy another goddamn ticket. Yeah, that's right. That's, uh, the police would have taken you out. <laughs> so you can't sleep here. So it's good that the value of movies is going down. Yeah. Who it, knows it, where it's going to go. It's a very complicated model uh, right now that we're dealing with. It, it, and not just Netflix, but the theater system. As long as there are writers out there writing quality scripts, we'll be okay, but there are not. <laughs> So Jay, do we have any more VCR repairing work to do? 
I think it's time to upgrade our computer system too. This is just a monitor. There is absolutely no computer attached to it. There's no power cord and this is not connected to it either. How do you misplace a whole fucking computer? You see, this, this isn't connected to anything. It was just awkwardly shoved behind the monitor? Yeah. So really, I think we really need to, to do some major renovations on the VCR repair shop. That sounds like a great storyline. I mean, a great idea. I have a better one. Let's just not do anything. Okay.